welcome everybody to the Talent Analytics Show. My name is Stacy Broadwell. I will be your host. Today we are joined by Anthony Ferreras. He is the Director of People Analytics for Nordstrom. So very excited to have you. Welcome to the show. Thanks. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> I was, oh, I I was making it. sure that you said Nordstrom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right? I, I would love to get a poll on this in the chat here. For the longest time, I have been saying Nordstrom's with an S at the end. And Anthony corrected me and said it's actually Nordstrom, no S. And I was just blown away by that. I was like, since when? And he's like, uh, what was it? You guys changed the name 10 years ago? Uh, it's been a while. I think since the 70s, something like that. Yeah. So at least part of me was was thankful that at least at some point it was Nordstrom's <laughs> before it was changed. I was like, how would I, um, but very interesting. But we're not gonna talk about name changes or rebranding or any of that today. Today we are talking about something that was uh, a question I had from a previous show that I didn't get an opportunity to ask. We're talking about finding RAD in talent. And RAD is actually an acronym Anthony, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that means? Yeah, yeah. So this is actually a, a passion area that I had been looking into for, for a while and very applicable to all the different companies that uh, I've been working for. But one of the, the things that I've uh, been um, interested in is why do some people, some high performers, survive through complex times, complex, volatile times like, for example, the year 2020, and some don't. And really quick synopsis of what we'll, what we'll see in my talk is, you know, the three characteristics that I found through my work are they're resilient, uh, they're adaptable, and they have drive. Um, and I can talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about what that means in a bit. So excited for this talk. I, I think it's an extremely interesting topic. And you know, when we first were speaking about this topic, I, I don't know why it escaped me, but this whole uh, transition of dealing with the whole COVID um, experience for everybody affects everybody in completely different ways. And if anybody's ever read the book, The Tipping Point, I think there's the, a lot of analogies in here where there's uh, one scenario and two different people will deal with that situation in extremely different ways. And resiliency just being how you're able to deal with really troublesome, difficult times in your life and if you can power through those. So i um, so excited about this show. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Anthony. Great. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, just wanted to confirm, do you see my main presenter screen? Uh, no, it was, it's in that one screen that where you can see uh, the slides at the bottom. Okay, let's see. How about now? Yes, you're good. Great. Okay, so I titled this Finding Rad Talent. Um, and so for those of you who lived through the 80s, maybe partially the early 90s, you know what rad is. I mean, I'm using it in more ways than, than one here, but I already described what the acronym is. And I think it's a really important thing to think about these days in identifying rad people along with the critical skills and tool sets that they need to get the job done. Um, really important during complex times, really important during any time, and it is across uh, different industries as well. So let me start a little bit about myself. I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but um, I started out my career through graduate school and a little bit after as a consultant in a small boutique consulting firm uh, based in San Francisco, which um, it no longer exists. San Francisco still exists, but the consulting firm doesn't. Um, then moved on to CHLA, which is uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, uh, then Direct TV, which is a satellite TV company. Uh, based in um, around LA, Los Angeles. Oh yeah, that's South to... Bay. <laughs> What's that? South Bay, Los Angeles. Yes, Direct TV. That's right. Uh, and then Symantec, 
which is cyber or was cybersecurity and data security. Uh, it has since been broken up. Uh, Peace went to some other company who acquired it, and then uh, the rest of it remained as uh, Norton LifeLock. And now at Nordstrom, which is, as you know, a chain of uh, luxury clothing retailer across the, the US, Canada, and online. My training is in industrial psychology, um, which I like to say is the original data scientist in HR before uh, data science was, you know, really a popular term. And then if you've worked with me often or in the past, you've probably heard me say data driven doesn't mean more data. It means the right data. And I think I say that way too often. And um, I'm not sure if if I'm getting some if people get annoyed with me with, every, uh, with all the times that I, I say that, but it is true. Um, oftentimes when we, when we think about being data driven in our work, we think about, well, let's look at all the data or let's look at more data, but that's not really the way to be data driven. The way to be data driven is to identify the right data to answer your, your question. So let me start um, this with a little story about a friend that I grew up with um, through high school, through junior high, through high school. And it's kind of an interesting, has an interesting kind of twist to the end that fits exactly the way that we needed to for this particular story and this particular topic. So someone I knew growing up, growing up was someone who was incredibly inspiring to me, really motivated me to be, you know, my best throughout my younger years. And this person, after high school, we both went to university after um, high school. And, you know, I went the traditional route where I um, started and finished my bachelor's degree in four years, about four years, and then went off to graduate school. Silly me, because my friend, in a matter of three years after high school, graduated from university with a uh, bachelor's and master's in computer science. Went off to uh, work for a tech company as a software engineer. And while I was in school, bought his first house during that time. So I was very, very jealous of what he was doing in his life, but I was really proud to have him as a friend. And I stayed in contact with him for a long time. And every time I talked to him, he always had a demeanor, like this happy demeanor, very driven, uh, very prideful in what he's been doing. He gloated about like the recognition that he got at work um, and about being on the fast track in, in his career. Really a positive person, really someone that I looked up to um, in the work that and how he, he got things done um, in his life. Very driven in his career. After a few years, he left that company for another one for higher pay, a uh, different title, that sort of thing, but basically did the same work as he'd been doing. Applying the same skills, the, the same motivation, everything, and in fact did really well there, at least at the beginning. Nearing a year, into his anniversary of uh, working there, um, I called him and we talked a little bit, but I noticed that his demeanor was very, very different. Less, he seemed less driven, less, I wouldn't say sad, but he wasn't happy like he was before. Um, he definitely didn't want to talk about work, seemed stressed out. It was totally a different friend um, than I remember before and then a few months after that i found out that he left his company and that was voluntary it wasn't involuntary but he left his company which was super strange to me um, usually a very committed person and um, i was just really curious about what happened there i had been following his company uh, through social media, through news, through the stock and all that stuff. And I had known that that company had been going through quite a bit. It was a tech company that was ever changing at least once a year 
to compete with a lot of the startups that um, popped up in that industry that gave it a lot of competition, uh, doing things better and quicker than that company did. What that resulted in during that time was a period of reorgs, changes, impacts to uh, teams. The teams were, were changed around, moved around. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on engineers to perform differently, work differently, um, change priorities, do things that they would not have done before, uh, start working on things that they don't like working on. Um, but all in the name of trying to keep the company afloat and come out of this sort of bad period uh, better. Well, he was frustrated during this time, from what I recall. He was very frustrated, very stressed out. He was very resentful uh, toward people who were now performing a little better than he was. He was not doing as well as he had been doing before. Uh, co-workers were doing much better. They were excelling. They were stressed out, but they were weathering. They were surviving uh, the complexity of, of the time. When it was all over, my friend was relegated to a less prestigious engineering team. He was in a very uh, prestigious R&D team um, when, when he started, but then was relegated to a lower or a less prestigious team. And some of those coworkers who were doing much better during that time were definitely recognized at least, and some of them were promoted. And I'm talking about not only high performers like he, who maintain their performance, but also lower performers who stepped up and did more during that time and did it better, better than he did at the time. And I actually hope that he's not listening. Um, I told him that I'd be talking about this story, but I hope that he's not actually listening. <laughs> um, so he was, result he was really frustrated uh, with all of that. And soon after he left the company. And that really stuck with me. I was blown away. This person who I admired so much basically um, fell, fell from you know that, that top that he was, that pedestal that he was on for quite some time. And you know, through my career, I noticed that that is not something that's isolated. Through my career, I found that you know, this, comp this complexity that that company dealt with is not isolated to that company. It's not isolated to any company, but all companies in some way deal with it at some point in their, in their lives. Um, and there's bigger, broad macro things that cause um, uh, complexity as well. There's this concept of uh, VUCA or VUCA that's been used or thrown around um, recently, but it's essentially it's volatile uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. This is an acronym that um, describes what's happening kind of in the business world for the past several, several years. So you can think of things like, um, it describes the recession in the early 2000, I think it was 2007, 2008, something like that. Uh, even before that, some other times, it, it, it describes um, in general, the tech industry. I came from the tech industry and I just recall how complex all of the time it was in dealing with uh, ever-changing times and just improving itself constantly. And this year. This, is, this year is a really good example of how volatile things can be, whether good or bad, whether it's a positively or negatively impacting your company. It is complex. It, it really is. And um, during times like this, you know, it. It counts to have the right talent who can sustain that, that productivity, that performance, that energy, or even um, improve during this time. And this is the, the thing that I found that differentiated those people who, who performed and didn't perform during these complex times. Why, uh, there, there were, or those high performers who performed or fell during this complex time. So what I wanted to do here and what became a passion of me to identify because 
What my friend went through was not isolated and I saw in constantly in the other companies that I've worked for is why does this concept of VUCA or this complexity cause some high performers with lots of potential to fall while others, including in some cases, lower performers thrive? It's a really interesting topic that I think goes beyond the different industries that I've worked for or that others have seen. It's a layer, a foundational layer of abilities or characteristics that when layered on with um, the skills and abilities that it takes for them to do their job well, it will give you a leading edge during times of this VUCA VUCA. Now, what I want to mention is that this isn't a meta-analysis of why this happens. Across um, some of the companies that I've done this analysis for, I haven't had the opportunity to do it for every company, but I won't mention which ones are uh, so that you can keep their anon uh, anonymity of, uh, uh, of who they are. Um, and in addition, what I want to do here to make it useful to you is to identify the characteristics to look for in candidates or how to look for them. And hopefully it is useful in your own work. So every company experiences this is what I've seen. Okay. Even in the companies that I have not uh, worked for, um, I've seen to some degree, you know, some complexity, some volatility, some something that it causes um, some stress, pressure, you know, heartburn in, in employees. But when crises or changes occur, what I've seen over that time is that a rally happens with employees. And oftentimes that is through the communication and the leadership of, of the, you know, the, the executives of the company. But essentially what I've seen across is that, you know, when this complexity evolves, you know, it causes this rally in, in employees to perform more, to work harder, to do things differently, to perform just better in, in general. And hopefully that sustains over the period of the time of complexity. But what actually happens during that time is that for some, that is a very short lived burst of whatever you want to call it, whether it's productivity or energy or whatever it is, but it, for some, it's not long-term. And as this situation evolves, it really naturally selects for uh, survivors. And so you have um, this blue line that represents those people who continue, who, go through the complexity, performing, helping the company survive, doing their best that they can do during the time, no matter the pressure, no matter the stress or any of that stuff. They just know that they need to get done and they're doing it. But it naturally, like I mentioned, it naturally selects others who um, are having a hard time keeping up with that. And for a lack of a better word, and I don't know if it actually is burnout, quite frankly, uh, I just know that the two groups the two um, groups of, of folks who are performing, not performing are different, right? But for a lack of a better term, they, there's a group that burns out over time. And what I've seen is, again, this is a meta-analysis, this is kind of an average across different companies that I've worked for, is that roughly around 30% of the high performers during a time like this of sustained complexity over time end up becoming average or lower performers by the end of uh, that situation. 50% of them leave voluntarily within a year, even after um, the complexity kind of goes away, um, they end up leaving. And then nearly all of the new lower performers, so those people who might've been average or high performers before, but through the complexity have become lower performers, uh, and have stayed for some reason, eventually leave involuntarily. And the way that we assessed um, performance was through uh, different uh, various ways, but you know, performance reviews, performance management things, um, through productivity software, that sort of thing. But that's how we, we got that information. Interestingly for me was that survivors were equally distributed among the performer types who, you know, whether they were 
high to low to average performers before the whole thing started. Those people, it was roughly an equal amount of those people were ended up, ended up being those who survived towards the end and performed, continued to perform well or better over time. And that's that second point is many of those who were lesser of, of a higher performer uh, it eventually elevated in their um, performance reviews to be better or perform better, be better performers. So I thought, this is, this is really interesting. I would have thought that high performers would have had the, school, the, the tool set abilities and skills to weather and continue to perform at, um, at a high level. But that wasn't true, you know, and some of them left. And that's really costly, you know, to have someone on staff to be a higher performer who provides a lot of great value to the team to then eventually um, downgrade in performance is very costly to the organization. And then what do you do after that? What I had mentioned before is that through some, some data work in profiling those people who are different, those who actually survived, whether they were high performers or not, um, had very similar characteristics. They were resilient, they were adaptable, and they were driven. And what I mentioned before is that not just driven for their own career growth, but also driven to help the company succeed. And that's an interesting distinct, uh, uh, distinction because those who were driven or what we found to be driven solely by their career journey were part of that red line. Of, of burning out. Kind of an interesting thing that we found there. The way that we discovered this was we found that there were some specific teams that were doing better than others. There were specific roles who were doing better than others. And really interesting that there were specific recruiters related to those teams, those roles, those people who were rad. And what I mean by that is that they were in some way um, involved in the um, candidacy of those people who we ended up finding to survive. And that specifically is what I want to make sure that you know this, this group um, takes from this, this presentation some, some recommendations to help you find rad, rad talent um, at the candidacy level. Before I get to that, um, really quick summary of how we identified RAD. Now this is a summary and it's not entirely inclusive of everything we looked at, but this is an example of the things that we pulled out to identify those people who were RAD and those people who were not and likely did not survive through through the complex times. One of the primary sources of this information was through employee surveys. So this is a sampling of the type of questions that we use to identify this concept of RAD. But essentially, those people who, those people were more likely to respond positively to things like uh, change management or readiness style questions. Uh, they were prideful in their company they had a discretionary effort to help their company um, weather through things or just help it succeed in general. And then finally, what I mentioned before is initiative in their own career, but also in helping their own com companies succeed. These were a few of the things that we, we found. The next thing is to try to track kind of over a long time of how that energy, productivity and positivity um, fluctuated, we looked at ambient data. And this is like unstructured data that's already out there in, um, in your systems. And it's all unstructured. It's like text um, information uh, that needs to be analyzed to identify just sentiment over time, mood over time, energy, and some of the different themes that are talked about during um, all different times uh, throughout the year. But especially when you're interested in identifying how your people are doing and weathering through complex times, it's really important 
to um, track how they're doing so that you know how to help them during that time. But this ambient data checks for sustainable energy over time, positivity, some of the things I didn't mention here, productivity during that time. Uh, they talk about in, you know, in that um, ambient data, they talk about how do we get this done? How, um, what else do we need to do this, right? Whereas others might talk about, you know, this is BS or uh, this, uh, this is putting a damper on my career uh, journey. This is, you know, all those sorts of things that are a little bit more self-driven, which is fine, right? But the combination of the two uh, being driven both um, for yourself and the company is really that key piece. Now, this isn't to show you how to identify, this whole presentation is not to show you how to identify those people internally in your company, but it's more around how to identify candidates who could fit this rad persona. But if you're interested in, in figuring, out, figuring out how to do this, you know, there are different tools that you can use. Obviously the survey, a survey tool is helpful for you know, that top piece, the um, employee survey piece. The ambient data is a little bit tougher to get at. Unstructured data is hard to analyze, and especially if you're dealing with thousands and thousands of unstructured things like through, we used performance management stuff, which is text related. We used um, case management information like through service center stuff um, and lots of other things that exist out there that's text-based to, to do some natural language processing to extract that, that sentiment. But if you want to do your own, there are tools out there that, that exist. I, they didn't, you know, no one's paying me to do this. It's just, this is a helpful tool to use, something called Motive. Um, they're a startup. Motive software helps um, analyze this information. Again, um, it's, they're not paying me to do this. They didn't ask me to do this. It's just a tool that you could possibly use. And um, the real interesting part was that they were more likely to have been asked certain questions in their job candidacy by the manager or the recruiter. And here's an example of some of the things that um, they were asking. This is not comprehensive. It's not everything that um, you could possibly ask. And you might even word these a little differently. But the main thing is what comes after these example questions is what do you look for in their answers? So some of the examples, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of the example questions include things like, tell me about a time when you had to deal with a large change that impacted your work and process. Tell me about a time when you had to shift your priorities from longer for longer than expected to deal with another urgent need. How did you manage the shift? What came of the former priority? Another one is, a common question that we often ask as hiring managers or recruiters is where do you see yourself in the next three years? The difference though is in the response and what you look for in some of these questions or the responses to these questions. Look for adaptability to change, you know, like adjusting their own processes, adapting work output to meet new needs, minimal complaining um, from that. And that's often very subtle. Uh, resilient to burnout, things like focus, eyes at the end of the at the end of the tunnel, uh, energy while telling the story, uh, or passion, uh, driven for self and company, learning it, using it as like a learning opportunity, taking initiative, language around helping the company. Those are really important things to look for. So whatever the question is related to these, what's helpful is looking for these particular types of responses. These these signs that um, could help you identify those rad people on top of, again, cannot stress how important, you know, those, those different skills to actually do the job are, but on top of, of that. So how has this helped um, in my experience? Well, you know, still look for, like I mentioned, still look for those skills or potentials to do the job. That's super important, right? But layer that piece around rad. Look for those signs, those characteristics through your questions. And that combined with being able to get the job done is, is, a, is a combination 
for sustainable productivity, sustainable performance, sustainable energy. I found that 86% uh, remained higher performers or high performers. 25% of low to average uh, performers became higher performers. And they had a much lower turnover rate. And the reason why I say much lower as opposed, uh, as opposed to a specific number is because that honestly depends on the industry, but um, there were improvements in turnover rates, both voluntary and involuntary, which should tell us that uh, lower involuntary probably means um, that uh, performance might not have been an issue. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I have my QR code there if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Some of these things, I wasn't very specific on um, some of the questions that we asked, like in surveys or anything like that. That wasn't the purpose of this particular talk. But if you're curious, you can message me on LinkedIn and I can give you an example or sample of, of what those were. And any other specific questions that aren't asked here? I, I have some questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where, where are we at on time? Oh, good. Lizzie. We have some time. Do you want to, uh, well, we'll give them a moment to take that screen share, that shot. Um, <clears throat> I thought this was such an interesting topic and um, so timely too. I, I guess I'd be curious if there are in using this, um, uh, would you call it a philosophy, a theory, um, um, a process, a method? <laughs> <laughs> have you put it into play recently and have there been any um, changes made on your own staff um, from from these from the results that you've you've put together in the data I'll uh, I'll talk specifically about my own uh, team only because if I talk about broader company then that kind of loses a little bit of the anonym, anonymity of the companies that I've done this sure for. yeah um, but yeah these are sometimes honestly sometimes I forget that I need to do this because there are times where I go long periods of time where I can't I don't hire and it's just not something that is drilled into every single interview that um, or every uh, rec that that I hire for but um, when given the when given the opportunity uh, or when I remember you know it's something that I continuously find helps me um, get or sustain the right talent. I also didn't even mention, because this was based on um, kind of the simpler, or not the simpler, but the easier side of getting to rad talent, which is through the candidacy um, phase. There's also the concept of being able to train or provide tools around this. Um, I haven't gone through, you know, the assessment of whether this is more of a personality trait or if it's something that can actually be trained or skill sets that can be trained in someone. Um, I mean, I think some of it can be trained, but there are some tools that by your team. There's um, some things that even like your uh, talent development teams can put in place to help managers. Um, help their employees go through these complex times. And quite frankly, a lot of it boils down to better communication. You know, I feel like there has, in so many of the conversations I've had, either with employees or partners, <clears throat> when you're faced with a obstacle in your business, and, and in, you know, being an entrepreneur, you, you come across those a lot, and, and you know, in any, company you do as well um, and when you're turning to your team and presenting these obstacles it's those that say point out the problems with it versus those who point out the solutions and that I think right there is a personality trait because it's those who are always thinking well this is how we can solve it and then there's those who just get stuck in the how and how I can point out why it's a problem um, but being able to go to that solution, I mean, certainly I've had those, those conversations. And I think I also like how you say that, <clears throat> especially during these volatile times, um, somebody who's going to be very uh, company focused on how I can help 
the company succeed versus the what's in it for me, um, what I need to take care of myself, what can I get out of this, those sort of, and, and absolutely, you can, you can, I think you can point out that personality right away as well. Um, you know, yeah. and uh, it's especially during this time, such a, you know, and I have a board of advisors and I am so thankful for all that they bring um, because it's all about the people who can help you get to the next stage and weather these storms and come up with solutions to help you grow. Um, so there was, it's interesting you asked, you, you mentioned the training because I, I remember this, I recall the story and I, and if anybody watches my show often, they've probably heard me talk about this uh, people analytics study where a, an analyst um, went and looked at 6,000 annual reviews of current employees, obviously, because they're annual reviews and deducted it down to two key skill sets that were valued the highest in these annual reviews. So the, the most valued uh, attributes of an employee that came out in these annual reviews. And number one was uh, cross communication and you know the ability to be resourceful, get up and talk to other departments and other managers and be resourceful. And then the second one was um, ownership of your process. Um, so a lot of, or, or just ownership. And so a lot of their departments functioned as startups still. And so that ability to be able to drive your process and own it without too much handholding was valued very highly. And so what they did with that information is they trained, they got um, funding for learning and development and they trained their current employees. And then the second thing they did was they, um, they implemented better recruitment strategies in being able to identify that talent when they're hiring and when they're recruiting and screening for um, new employees. So finding those, those particular attributes. So um, I, and I never followed up with the question was with, I wonder what those questions were and I wonder what that training was like. Um, Cause it was just, you know, just interesting that they even thought of doing that. Um, but you put that slide of questions up and, you know, of how you can actually in the recruitment process, ask questions that really are geared towards resiliency and looking for those type of answers. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm, my, my career or my function is people analytics. So I'm always going to argue for, you know, finding the right data to analyze, to give you the right answers, to help you make uh, decisions. But in, um, in my experience, there is something to say um, for, you know, just the simplest way of identifying when you don't have the fancy analytics, when you don't have like an assessment at the beginning, like what I think you're uh, mentioning, when you don't have something to tell you, Based on these things, this is what you should, you know, uh, you should either hire or not hire this, this person. You know, there's something to say that there is some success in, um, in doing your own work, understanding how these people, how these candidates um, respond to these answers. Intuition is, you know, it's not right 100% of the time. You know, but there are some studies out there that, that show that in often cases for recruiting the, the best talent, you know, there, there are some people who can identify certain things in, in people. And this is an easy way of, of doing it. Um, it's just looking for the types of answers, like you said, looking for the types of answers that relate to resiliency, adaptability, driven, um, those things. And likely, not 100%, but likely you probably have a good candidate mm, yeah um there was a couple questions i believe um maura hey how's it going maura she's she's on all of my shows actually i enjoy spending time with you maura um she wants to know is there a way to tell a rad candidate by looking at the linkedin profile that's a great question are there maybe specific things that they might put in there that might be like this is a resilient person <laughs> what are your thoughts well, you know, we just, uh, you were talking a little bit about it. I talked a little bit about it. Um, you know, if you could identify the language in, uh, in their LinkedIn profile uh, around, you know, helping the company, um, driven for their own career, um, ex ex experience, 
um, driving through change, you know, those sorts of things, projects that they've done around that. I think those are some good indicators. I personally have not um, done it from the perspective of looking at a LinkedIn profile, but I would assume that, you know, someone who is has that personality or has that profile would focus on, on sharing um, what they're proud of um, that includes those few characteristics in their LinkedIn pro uh, profile. So I would look for those sorts of things. Only in, in, my, in my head, I'm thinking of all the really rad sourcers and recruiters that I know. And I can just like visualize them putting a Boolean string together right now <laughs> that uses word change and resiliency. And I mean, if you're looking for diverse candidates, you might put um, keywords together that might include ERG, or um, uh, you know, black colleges, historically black colleges, and and I'm um, using specific acronyms. Um, and and I'm curious, like, so if you were to think of some of those those keywords, would change management? Um, I don't know. What what are some that might come to mind for you, Anthony? Um, I think they use they use more like if we if I go back to the uh, ambient data piece. So trying to relate, you know, what we've seen in, in unstructured data to and trend possibly to something like LinkedIn. Uh, we actually found things that are, you know, very, on face value, very relevant. Um, things like um, a, a manager reviews uh, is very driven to get things done. Um, does sees sees their projects through to to the end um, initiative um, you know things like that i've seen yeah. pop up through that that kind of passive listening passive type of ambient data analysis that helps identify uh, those pieces um, change is is a good one that you mentioned i think is as well um, and dealing with change really good um examples of that. transformation maybe yeah 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 um yeah i was oh, talking about um language around specifically about you know um you know helping their company uh, yeah i um i'm i wanted to dive into a little bit about the ambient data because i've never heard it called ambient data and i think that's a great term for it because um it's real okay so when um i think i think of network analysis right um and and that sort of thing where yeah. companies can look um uh, specifically they can look at uh risk factors for um current employees such as they might look at if traditionally you were answering emails first thing in the morning and you're communicating with you know xyz person to suddenly three months in you start to get a little complacent or bored and you're answering your emails instead really late at night. Um, the cadence has fallen. Um, you know, while companies maybe aren't looking at looking at your emails, they can see the the trend of when you're replying and, and that sort of thing. And that's something that companies actually do look at for flight risks. And is that an example of the ambient data that you're referring to? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great example of it. Um, of course, you know, uh, looking at things, uh, keeping things anonymous, uh, right, in ambient data, because that could be, you know, that could be messages, it could be, but importantly, it could be other things as well, like the case management data, the people coming, calling into your HR service center, for example, um, taking a look at what's the, the trends around that. Um, the performance management data is often unstructured, uh, like the manager's um, uh, assessment of their employees or how their employees kind of assess their own work, that sort of thing. You know, there's ambient data and unstructured data is really interesting to me because when you look at, when you think about things like a, a survey, now surveys nowadays are do capture a good kind of reality of what's actually happening but you still have error to that um, you still have people who are unsure about it and might just um, click on the neutral or whatever you know they or all 
positive or something like that, right? But unstructured data, text comment, it's really hard to, to hide um, some of your your moods, your feelings, your what you know, what what is driving you, all that stuff. And so, ambient data is one of my favorite things to look at um, to really get a good sense of how we're we're doing as a company. So you have a psychology degree, is that is that correct? Yeah, my I have two masters, one in um, industrial organizational psychology, mm-hmm. and then uh, the one before that was clinical psychology, but mostly research. It was not a uh, practice. It was just research around clinical psychology. I absolutely, we have like 10 more minutes, but I love, I wrote this down, what you said at the beginning of the show. Um, and it was, I was the psych, I forgot how you said it, but I was like trying to write that down because it was um, like the psychology was the original data scientist before data scientists were cool. <laughs> Do you remember what you said? It was like, yeah, we, we were the original data scientists, but it's true. And there's this massive explosion right now. I'm sorry. Do you remember what you, how you phrased that? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm dating myself a little bit because this was before the term people analytics existed before yeah. the term data science was exi- existed. Um, and in HR, um, certainly HR wasn't going to do any, uh, or at least wasn't going to be one, one of the forerunners in data scientists, but what we did have in HR were industrial organizational psychologists who were heavily quantitative, um, research-based um, HR folks uh, or training in, in a similar topic. And um, we did a lot of what data scientists do um, in a different way within HR. And so that's why I call us uh, the original data scientists in, in HR. That, you know what, um, I'm actually glad that you made that distinction because I actually thought IO psychology was relatively new. And mostly because I've been so, I come from an analyst background. I was a financial analyst. I have a degree in finance and statistics. And um, I graduated during the financial explosion (laughs) or implosion of the mortgage and banking crisis of 2007 and 2009. (laughs) Worst time to graduate with a finance degree and go into working for an investment house. I worked for Mellon Capital, but um, I I am so intrigued by how HR has just been embracing data. And then you hear all these terms like IOS psychology and people analytics and like, you know, our show, the talent analytics, where I'm trying to really tie it to like how you hire and recruit and bridge those. And I'm just extremely intrigued and, and fascinated. I'm just obsessed with how we're asking these hypotheses and questions, but I, I don't think I realized that Iowa psychology had always been a lo- around and had had a seat in HR this entire time. I thought this was something relatively new. And, and if you look at the, uh, if you look at the Bureau of Land Statistics and you dive into that data, um, which is, is so fascinating. Like, look at this beautiful graph. Um, they, they come up with such interesting things. I like lose myself. <clears throat> Anyways, uh, there was this uh, chart and it was, I think it was like last month, they came up, they come up with projections for careers. IO psychology, Anthony was like number one with 27% growth projection. And I think it was even more than like data science or something in the next, like three to five years, like by 2027 or something like that, you know, like that was, it was like that field right there is blowing up and maybe it's the marketing of the people analytics and, and, uh, that sort of thing that is maybe helped driving it. Yeah, it might be, it might be. We, we definitely have embraced it over the last uh, few years. Uh, but yeah, you're right. IO psychology has been around for a very long time, but always kind of it always seemed like to be in kind of the the shadows uh, but always the, we have a lot of people out there doing uh, this work and HR in general um, yeah I've been seeing a lot of groups popping up in the people analytics and um, there it's a very like close-knit group and it's interesting I what I found with uh, people analytics professionals is they often sometimes, can't seem to tie it back to recruiting 
And I feel like it's mm. so completely interrelated. And I'll have conversations with um, people, analytics professionals, and they're like, I don't know how this ties to hiring or recruiting. And I'm like, what? Like, that seems to me like such a miss right there that almost I feel like it needs education, right? And that's like, I feel like a, a breakdown, um, unless I'm missing something, because I can understand how they're like evaluating employment data or something. But unless like those, I feel they are tied back to like we were talking about today, recruiting and screening um, your, your, you know, your potential employees, then and then bringing them into the organization so you can then evaluate them. I mean, it's got to be a full loop, right? I don't know. Has that been your experience or no? Absolutely. Um, so I think as people analytics grows and evolves, uh, we're getting better at it. The, the brand of analytics or people analytics in particular that, that I subscribe to um, and that you know, I strategize around is more holistic. Um, and that's another kind of word that I use quite frequently is I'm not, um, I don't think it's useful to answer a talent acquisition or recruiting question solely based on recruiting or talent acquisition um, data. Yeah, I don't think it's useful to answer a, pro, uh, a retention style question only looking at things like um, uh, money or compensation, uh, the turnover numbers or things like that. I don't think it's useful to look at that. It's helpful to understand what's happening, but to get a good answer and to answer those pressing questions like how do we improve diversity in our company? How do we improve uh, productivity? How do we have sustainable productivity through complexity, all that stuff? It's more holistic than that. So when somebody comes to me with like a narrow question focusing on like recruiting, I always ask to try to broaden that. Um, and even if it's not broadening that, um, it's more along the lines of how do we answer it in a way that helps support that particular topic? So if somebody's asked me, how do we hire more um, more rad people? I'll ask, why do you need to hire more rad people? Um, what, what's happening with the ones that are here, right? Um, and beyond that, right? How do we answer it from all different angles, including recruiting? So I see there are these two other areas of data and people analytics and and uh, we got maybe one two more minutes um that i feel like you guys are all running neck and neck and and i'm looking to see how it's going to merge together number one obviously the people analytic analytics looking at employee data in the hris in like you know the multiple like the the um network analysis um, and the, that type of data, maybe even external data and seeing how you compare <clears throat> people analytics. And then the talent intelligence, right? So we're looking at external competitive data and that really applying to um, recruitment and talent acquisition along every angle of the funnel or at every level of the funnel from top to bottom and how we can elevate each of those areas with competitive analysis, with, um, with intelligence of our talent pool and a potential talent pool. And then, and then the third one, um, it is talent attraction. And talent attraction is not just employer branding, it's recruitment marketing, it's employer branding, it's onboarding where they have this really warm welcome, they feel included, it's this like welcoming thing. And then like getting them set in once they're an employee into maybe it's employee resource, resource groups, or helping them feel included in that company, right? And that full cycle. How are all these teams, these different talent attraction, talent intelligence, people analytics, eventually are gonna have to be able to share, centralize all this data and come together. Um, Cause it's three different areas, almost kind of doing, interlaying the same sort of function. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I think, I see them as needing to blend in some way, needing to come together and find some 
um, I'm going to use it again, some holistic way to tell the story of, of your talent uh, or of the external candidates uh, or, you know, how everything all fits together. And, um, you know, from the from that more complete perspective, I do recommend, you know, taking into consideration all those things to better provide the evidence that your stakeholders and your decision makers need to make a better um, decision, right? I always say that if you answer it from one, one, one of those perspectives that you just mentioned, you know, you're missing all these other things here, right? bringing it all together. Um, I, I would prefer to bring in all those things, even from the perspective <laughs> of external research, to bring in, sorry? I agree with you. I mean, I guess that's just budget, right? And what your goals are, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we are at the top of the hour. Anthony, thank you so much for this um, this talk. It has been super um, interesting. If anybody would like to get hold of you, how can they do that? Uh, through LinkedIn. Uh, so I flashed the, the scan me thing. Uh, let me- Yeah, if you wanna share that again do that one more time. But through LinkedIn, you can message me there, um, ask any additional questions that you might have uh, missed. And happy to happy to get connected. It's the spelling of the name, the last name, Anthony, obviously, but the Ferreras, F-E-R-R-E-R-A-S. Um, it's a double R here. <laughs> keep yeah, F-E-R-R-E-R-A-S. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And we'll see everybody next week, uh, Wednesday, um, every Wednesday for the Talent Analytics Show. And starting next week, we're moving back one hour to 10 um, a.m. Pacific time just to accommodate children going back to school and what have you. So we really appreciate if you will um, uh, see us then. Everybody have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye.